Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, pregnancy-focused chiropractor, Dr. Elliot Berlin. My guest today is a health-conscious, fashion-forward, multi-talented artist. She is best known for her work in film and television, as well as her powerful voice as a singer-songwriter. She's also a new mother-to-be and is currently training to be a labor support doula. We're thrilled to have her here with us to share her journey today. In this first part of a two-part series, we'll delve into her childhood, career, relationship, health and wellness, pregnancy, plans for birth, and her business, Rumor Has It. Rumor Willis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, what an honor. Okay, you're incredible on a million levels and you have a lot going on. (laughs) And I want to cover all of it, but let's start to the beginning. What was growing up like? Oh my gosh, you know, I feel so lucky to have been exposed to so much as a kid especially now as i'm you know in this transition to motherhood i feel even though i I say missed out on certain things like i still have to sometimes count basic math on my fingers or you know my essay writing format is maybe not great from not being in school you know as much like i got to travel and meet so many people and have so many experiences and I don't know. I feel like it kind of nurtured this goofiness and silliness and curiosity in me that I really want to help cultivate in my kids. Oh my gosh. I think we all need some of that. I think the world would be a much more relaxed, better place if we had more goofiness and silliness. So did you homeschool? We were primarily based in Idaho. So I grew up in Sun Valley, Idaho. And then when my parents would work, we would go and be with them, you know, on set. So we would, you know, be in school for a couple months in Idaho. And then all of a sudden we were in the Czech Republic for a couple weeks, or we were, you know, my mom was doing GI Jane and we were in like Fort Lauderdale in Florida. So like there were all these different weird places. That seems like three completely separate set of textbooks. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you go into all these different places and We stayed in a house that was haunted. There were gravestones outside of the house in one place we stayed. You know, it was wild. But I'm so grateful and feel so lucky that I got to experience so much. We homeschooled our kids for two years. And I felt like the first year was an experiment. We had looked into it as, you know, maybe this will be more economical than sending our kids to Mm -hmm. private school. And it wasn't. But... (laughs) (laughs) and we realized it wasn't going to be before we did it but once we started to explore the families that were doing it we fell so in love with it and we did it and then we realized okay it takes six months to get the swing of things and you know we didn't really get a full experience so we did it for one more year but the coolest things were like instead of opening up a book to learn how the post office works literally going to the post office and saying to them you know i'm trying to teach my kids how mail works is there anything you can show them? Can we see anything about the process? And they would take you in the back and you could just see all the sorting machines and all the people working what they're doing. And, wow. and there was a supervisor there who was just more than excited to show how from the minute the mail gets there or the package gets there, all the processing and how it goes to the trucks and which ones are rooted to airplanes. And it was just like a whole different experience. And it sounds like that's how you learned about life. So yeah, you might have to count on your fingers, but I mean, invaluable kind of life lessons. Well, I do think it's important. And to your point, I would have loved in school to have had, you know, this is how you apply for, I don't know, like how to balance your checkbook. Not that people use checkbooks that much anymore, but you know, this is how you create a budget for yourself. This is, you know, maybe teaching you about nutrition or just so many life skills that I feel like I would love to have had included in a curriculum that I now would hopefully try and find a way to supplement for my kids in some way. Well, I mean, pros and cons to both, but most people get the didactic education, not so much real life. And maybe you were heavy on the real life side and not so didactic. So <laughs> yeah. perhaps a balance, a balance in there. Exactly. Okay, so then how did you get started in your career? I I think just from growing up on sets, it was all I ever wanted was to just do what my parents did because it just was this entryway into this world that you could be anything, you could, you know, you could completely transform yourself, whether it be with a wig or a costume and 
you know, it's like a very high class version of getting to play pretend as a kid. And there was something about it, even from a young age, that I just was so drawn to. And I've always sung and was putting on shows. And I think that's just kind of part of my personality. I'm such a, you know, performer. And even the way I talk, I talk with my hands so much, you know. <laughs> and so <laughs> I couldn't imagine anything else when I was a kid growing up. And so I got to be in a couple different movies with them when I was growing up. But they really wanted me to finish school and not do, you know, a GED or something like that, which I'm glad on one hand, but I also wish that I could have started learning the tools and the craft of acting from a younger age so that I could have really implemented that discipline in myself as I got into my 20s and was a little like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you start to study the craft? I went to about a semester of college at USC and I just wasn't happy and I just was feeling really unfulfilled. So I kind of came back to my mom and I said, listen, can I create my own school that I'm accountable to? And so I got a job working at Mark Jacobs as a salesperson. And then I did singing, acting, and piano lessons like twice a week. And then I was auditioning for movies and TV because that's what I really wanted. So during that time, I ended up leaving college and I ended up getting my first kind of like acting job separately of my parents. And then it just kind of started going from there. Did you do more training with your acting? Over the years, this and that, but I got a bit derailed in my 20s, I think, because I was so, I don't know, I was just all over the place. Like I wanted to work, but I kind of felt a little bit ungrounded in exactly what I wanted to do. And I have a tendency to get a bit distracted. It's definitely a little bit <laughs> ADD. So I didn't have that hunger to really get out and dedicate myself in the way that I think now I would want to. And is there a defining moment for you where you felt like, wow, this is big. I have momentum. Well, I think a few in different ways. You know, I did a movie called The House Bunny that really was like probably the biggest studio kind of thing I had done, which was super fun. But again, it was like I would get momentum and then I would kind of let myself down or not follow through with it because I think I just, as I've gotten older, I think I was... I'm still continuing to work through like this unworthiness narrative, right? Of like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough or maybe I'm not talented enough. So I'm just not going to fully put all of myself into it so that I can never really fail, which I'm yes. sure a lot of people can relate to. Absolutely. Yes. What about in music and singing? I feel very unfulfilled in certain ways, even though someone else could look at me from the outside and be like, wow, you've done so much. And I've even had that reflected back to me by my partner. But in some ways, I feel so unfulfilled in terms of my creativity because I think I've held myself back in a lot of ways out of a fear of failure or out of a fear of, I don't know, just not being good enough. And I think it's been really interesting as I've gone through this pregnancy, I've realized that what I really want to teach my kid is is how okay it is to fail, how it's so important to allow yourself to try things that you are afraid that you won't be good at and to try things that you are worried you might look silly so that you can really get back up there and write a bad song or, you know, look silly or maybe not do the best job in service of just learning. You know, what's interesting. I think a lot of us, myself definitely included, have fear of failure and therefore don't put ourselves out in the way that we aspire to. But not everybody is really so self-aware about it. <laughs> and even those of us who are more self-aware about it, not so comfortable talking about it. And I don't know if that's motherhood kind of pushing you to think and process your own life and like how you want, you know, your kids chapters to be different than yours, or if that's how you are in general. But I find you to be a pretty deep thinker. You're like an interesting bundle of fun, serious, 
deep, goofy, you know, but also warm hearted, just so kind and warm hearted. Thank you. But now something that I'm learning about you is just that like you self process and you're okay sharing what you're learning about yourself, at least for your kids and now voyeuristically for the rest of us. Well, I think it's important. I think it's important to be able to own it in a way so that if you just try and hide it and pretend like I did that for so many years, I was like, I am trying my hardest. But the truth is I wasn't. And the only way that I can actually change that behavior is by acknowledging it. And I think to your point, like a lot of it was I got sober at 27 and I wasn't working as much because I was kind of all over the place. And then I really deep dived into a lot of self excavation of old patterns of misidentifications and things. And so that has kind of been my journey for the last, you know, six years of working here and there, but really just working on myself. And in a weird way, I feel like might be woo woo for some people, but I feel like that I was almost doing preemptive work to prepare myself for motherhood. Oh, wow. I mean, actually, I don't think that's super woo woo, but if it is fine, I hope you do more music. I think you I have would like to powerfully beautiful, soft voice. And like, you have so much heart in you that I think your music can be really moving and in some ways therapeutic for people. So I'm coming for the album. <laughs> you mentioned, you know, kind of getting sober. What were you getting sober from? Um, I would say like alcohol and yeah, mostly alcohol. I would say, and it was even hard for me at the time when I was 27 to identify as an alcoholic, but I think that I was just really unhappy. And so I think that I was feeling unfulfilled and I wasn't dealing with all of these emotions that I was stuffing down about, you know, my unworthiness or my judgment of self or not being fulfilled creatively or, you know, feeling like why can't I find a boyfriend? You know, what's wrong with me? All of the spinning thoughts that we all have all day. And I did a, a cabaret tour and, you know, was definitely living that musician's life, probably not like nourishing myself properly. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I had this moment one night, actually it was New Year's. It was the day before New Year's or New Year's Eve. And I just, I wasn't even having fun. We had, you know, wine and we got in a hot tub or something, which I know is bad. Don't do that, kids. <laughs> <laughs> and I started, I would get panic attacks about how bad I would feel the next day already while I was trying to just like enjoy the evening. And I just had a moment the next day where I was like, this isn't even fun. I'm not even getting to enjoy the part that people enjoy. And I kind of started off, it was just going to be sober January. And then I just kind of kept going. And here I am. <laughs> six years later. <laughs> so. Wow. Congratulations. It's Thank not you. easy to do. I'm still struggling with meatless Monday. I get it. <laughs> I'll get there. I'll get there. Sugar is my other one that uh, my, my sugar free Sunday. Oh, I mean, the sadness, I cannot even imagine the life growing up under a microscope, under a magnifying glass, mm -hmm. very front and center. First child to two blockbuster actor parents always in the spotlight and number one i could see how anyone would be like maybe i'm an imposter maybe i'm <laughs> i'm not a great yeah. actor maybe i just know people and then also like not really getting a chance to sort of develop on your own or like i don't know did you have zits as a teenager and everybody oh my saw God, yeah. that i think was one of the most and still to this day i think is one of the most challenging things around my self-value that i really worked on I would say mostly even in the last like two years, because, you know, when you're having an awkward phase, when you're 14 and then there's paparazzi taking photos of you and, you know, you don't look great or you're just trying to figure out your style or, you know, or whatever it may be, but people were nasty. People said horrible, horrible things about the way that I looked, about how ugly I was, like the onslaught of negativity especially about my appearance was so devastating to the way that i viewed myself and the way that i was holding the same perception that some like troll on the internet from god knows where just throwing an offhanded comment not thinking about it and 
I think that also played a huge part in just all of that, not wanting to like fully dive in and put myself out there because it just felt like I was setting myself up to just get torn apart really in a lot of ways. And, you know, the internet has only grown. We only have more outlets for, you know, the TikTok and Instagram. I can't imagine being a teenager. If I had had to go through what I went through when there was just a few blogs being nasty to what it is now, it's, it's unimaginable. That's part of the reason why I feel really strongly about not giving my kids an iPad and not mm. a phone as a binky. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, our kids were exposed to screen time, but they don't get devices until they're in high school. And then that yeah. might even be too soon, but they're very restricted devices. They don't have social media or anything like that. And, you know, even my oldest, who's 18, he can make his own choices now, but he sees the downside of all that. And he has a kosher phone that literally calls and texts and that's about it. Which is, I think, all you need, you know, to a certain extent. <laughs> I do think it's important to expose them, but at the same time, you know, I think that there's just got to be a bit, I don't know, of understanding. I think if you can really build up and focus and showing by example, that's the biggest thing that I learned that I really want to impart on my kids is you could tell your kid they're beautiful. You could tell their kid how amazing they are. But if you don't reflect that with how you treat yourself, it means nothing. That's so powerful and such a big life lesson. <laughs> I only really started coming around to that literally this year and i'm years and years ahead of you that's so powerful <laughs> rumor let's take a little break and we'll be right back <laughs> welcome back we're talking to rumor wallace super pregnant still in my mind is you in the spotlight as a teenager and of course you need to numb yourself to that like who wouldn't want to sounds like you chose alcohol as your numbing agent of choice mm -hmm. but even after like sober january how do you recover from that and also still granted by choice now somewhat in the spotlight how do you you know i mean obviously i think anybody that looks at you would not describe you as anything other than very nice to look at everything i described about you in your heart is how you look on the outside mm -hmm. too very sweet yeah. and warm and beautiful but to yourself you may not always see that how did you come around to like accepting you or more than just accepting embracing yourself and loving how you look and feel well i think there was a lot of me that well especially right after i got sober all of a sudden you go from numbing everything and shoving it down and it was like this huge moment for me because all of a sudden when there's no distractions there's no people call them medicators right so it can be food shopping men alcohol drugs whatever right and i think my distractions were definitely like alcohol and dating when you eliminate those from your life suddenly then you're feeling feelings for the first time and I was so overwhelmed. My body went through this like crazy detox healing crisis that kind of forced me to stay home. And I got shingles. Like I had all of this like crazy health stuff for like a good three months. And so I just had to sit with myself and I had to just, I don't know, like let all of the emotion come out. And it was interesting because the emotions came out very physically which I think can happen to all of us. I mean, I think if you don't deal with something emotionally, it will manifest physically. Physically how? Well, I think, you know, for people who say have anxiety, then they usually tend to have a lot of stomach problems or people who, you know, I've seen friends of mine who have a real problem with speaking up for themselves, who then always somehow have some sort of respiratory thing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Or like grief is like your lungs are kind of associated with grief. So I deep dived into a lot of this kind of healing stuff because I just was kind of like leveled by the level of anxiety. And I was overwhelmed by sensation because I had been so numb. Physical sensation. Yeah. Just anything that was above, you know, like a flat line was so intense. And so I would get such bad physical anxiety, panic attacks. 
And, you know, I worked really hard to find like coping tools to slowly tiptoe and do these like three foot tosses and baby steps to kind of get my body used to feelings like high sensation things again. Almost like a desensitization, meaning you went from totally mm -hmm. numb to hypersensitive. Yeah, to everything. And I, you know, was lucky enough and privileged enough to be able to do this incredible class called the Spiritual Psychology, which was at University of Santa Monica with these incredible teachers. I got to do it with my, my mom and my sister, and it changed my life. It was one of the most profound classes I've ever taken. It was like three years of it, and it used to be a master's program, and it truly was life-changing. I think that's the reason why I have the relationship I have, why I'm a mom right now. Like It shifted my whole life. Wow, that sounds so powerful. And indeed, today you still kind of have this interesting duality where you're so mellow and relaxed in some ways, but also kind of anxious <laughs> in other ways, which is interesting. It must be interesting for you to juggle, but it's also interesting to watch. Tell me about where in this big picture did Dancing with the Stars come in? Ooh, so I did Dancing with the Stars, I think maybe like a year or two before I got sober. And everyone in my life was like, do not do this show. You are crazy. <laughs> this is good. Like you've never danced before. Don't do this. And I don't know. There was something about it where I love a challenge. Like if I'm given a challenge or something to the rise to the occasion to, I would say nine times out of 10, I do. And that's where I thrive is in that kind of situation, especially if I'm being taught something. You know, I had a teacher one on one every day going, you know, six to eight hours a day dancing, which was the craziest thing physically I've ever done on my body other than pregnancy. But it was incredible. I loved it. I was learning a new skill. I felt like I was doing something that was completely my own, that had no attachment to my family and something that I didn't think that I would be good at and that out of nowhere I was. And I ended up winning, which was kind of amazing. I mean, amazing. Still now, many years later, congratulations. But Thank just you. the dances that you guys did. And, you know, he's a professional. You were brand new at it. Like, it's so many things. Entertaining, but wildly entertaining. And you're, like, looking and you're like, no, she must have started dancing when she was three. <laughs> You know, and this is just came easy to her. It's so effortless the way you dance, and it makes the viewers so relaxed and just entertained to watch. Thank and you, you can feel so much through your dancing. I was just blown away. Literally, until you just said that, I assumed that you grew up dancing. Oh my gosh, not at all, because we didn't have time. I would start a dance class, and then we would leave town. Or I would start a gymnastics class and then we would leave town. I mean, I did give my mom a little bit of a talking to after Dancing with the Stars because I said, I'm great at this. You couldn't have put me in a dance class and just forced me to do it even if I complained, you know? And of course, then that got my wheels turning and be like, oh, man, my kids, they better know another language or two, <laughs> dance classes, music. I never thought I would say those kind of things as a mother, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know. And actually to realize that that was pre-sober, that's pretty amazing to be ADD and dependent on alcohol and to accomplish all that is mind-blowing. Honestly, mind-blowing. It was cool. I mean, I wasn't ever drinking to where it was like what you would typically think, you know? I kind of was that person that like if I was sad or if I needed confidence, you know, I didn't feel okay as just myself. Sure, but what larger spotlight than Dancing with the Stars? I, so. I know. It's like I feel like I have two people inside of me sometimes. It's There's one true. who's just like so calm, so relaxed, and then the other is this like hypervigilant, anxious control freak, and I'm trying to integrate them gently so that they can Fuse. All You're fusing them thrive. together. Well, I like both of them. Right now, I mean, you're pretty health and wellness conscious. What's your approach? Well, I think when I got sober and I just saw all of these things that I, like, I'd never had anxiety, like I said before, and I just wasn't in tune with my body at all before that. Wasn't conscious of what I ate, taking vitamins, taking care of myself. And that really shifted because I'd never really been sick like that before. I'd never really had all of these health things. I rarely ever got a fever or got sick like normal people, you know, in, in the just scope of a year. And so I really started paying attention to, okay, well, 
what am I eating? You know, I stopped kind of eating gluten and sugar and I just really tried to pay attention to what I felt I needed. I mean, I was so bad. I used to never even like drink water. I would maybe have like one bottle of water in a day. And I don't know. I just wanted to try and listen to myself and slow down because I felt like there was this little kid inside of me. I've done a lot of like work around, what do they call it? Inner child work, I guess. And I felt like there was this little kid inside of me that was screaming that was like, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I need you to take care of me. And so I'm going to outlet all of these crazy things in your body so that you listen to me. Oh, wow. That's deep and powerful. (laughs) We like to go deep. (laughs) And then, you you know, know, I don't know if that's the woo you were talking about, but like as taking care of your inner child as a gateway to motherhood. Yeah, I think a lot of that had to do with kind of like reparenting myself and noticing how I was dealing with so much pain or victimhood around other people's rejection of me or my perception of other people's rejection of me when I was actually really rejecting myself. I was being meaner than they were. I was saying, oh, you're so ugly or you're fat or God, like your hair looks like or, you know, whatever it was that particular day. And so I was actually being the biggest bully to myself and really had to just reframe even the language that I think how you speak to yourself is so important, not just as an example for your kids, but for what you hear. I think your body listens. Yeah, totally. But I wonder if that's like, okay, if I'm the meanest to myself, then whatever somebody else says won't be as bad as what I said about myself. A little bit. Yeah. And it's also, I think it's a self-protective mechanism as well of You know, and similarly how people do with dating, where they're like, oh, well, if I keep someone at arm's length, then I'll never really be hurt kind of idea. And never feel love. Now you are pregnant. (laughs) I'm very pregnant. (laughs) Very pregnant. How many weeks? I'm 34 weeks. So I'm in that chunk that I'm sure all of the gals call you and are just like, I'm ready for this baby to be out of Put me. I fork can't get any bigger. Yeah, I'm yes. ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Is motherhood something that you've been thinking about for a while? My whole life. Like the one thing I think in my life that has been like the biggest dream and felt like my like divine purpose in the world like i feel so privileged to have this experience especially when i know how many women struggle with it and i couldn't be more excited i'm so delighted to be a mom and also this experience has been so deeply humbling in what ways well i think because for so many years i was so confident about you know i might have stuff around you know my work and my career and relationships but like being a mom, being pregnant, I'm just going to thrive. And then cut to, you know, your six weeks, eight weeks, and I was just laid out. And Mm. just physically, it's hard. Are those things that you logically didn't know, like you hadn't heard about, or you just thought that's not going to be me? Like there's things that you know about, you go, oh yeah, people have morning sickness. Oh yeah, that people talk about being really tired. But I think the biggest thing for me was being so emotional and having the hormones like you have to surrender like you are not in control of your body you are not in control of your emotions you are not in control of anything and that the part of me that is a bit more perfectionistic and kind of has that desire to control I just felt like the rug just got out from under me And it was challenging because I felt so much shame because I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is happening to me that I've wanted my whole life that I'm so unbelievably happy about. And also it's really hard physically. And then again, in that same position of like being mean to myself and battling myself of like seeing all my friends who were pregnant and seeing people on Instagram being like, oh, I'm delighted and I'm having the best day and I I feel so connected to my baby and I'm over here being like I feel like I'm on a mushroom ayahuasca journey every day I'm <laughs> lightheaded like I can't get enough food like what <laughs> you know it was just like well Instagram I mean my Instagram guy me on Instagram 
he's got his stuff together in a way that I wish I had my stuff together. I mean, <laughs> my New Year's resolution is to be more like my Instagram guy. <laughs> and so if we're using Instagram as a barometer of what reality is like, we're going to always be a little bit let down. But even just thinking about, here's a beautiful thing that I've realized about myself. I have the most unbelievable imagination. And I think that's from being a little kid traveling places and seeing things. And I can paint a picture of a fantasy or of a plan that I have or manifest it, right? But then I noticed, and this has been something I've been working on, especially during my pregnancy, it's come up as a big lesson of when reality doesn't look like the picture, all of a sudden I get so thrown off. So I had all of these ideas about how I would be so comfortable and easeful being pregnant and you know, I painted this whole picture for myself and I'm not going to find out the gender and my sister's going to be there and I'm going to have a home birth and all of these things. I painted this elaborate picture and then all of a sudden I'm dealing with how it really feels to be pregnant and how physically taxing it is or feeling challenged to connect with my baby in a way that I didn't think would happen to me. And then being so caught up in the fact that it didn't look like how I thought that I couldn't even allow myself the grace or the dignity to adjust to the reality. I have now, but it, it, it took a while, you know? That's also very powerful. But I think that's the Instagram phenomenon, you know, on steroids. The fact that we have a vision of what things are. And it's sort of a combination of the fact that sometimes those are not just rooted in reality. They're just, you yeah. know, very airbrushed experiences put out there as if this is my life. I mean, I know people who are going through huge, bloody relationship battles and on the verge of divorce or worse. And, you know, they're still posting to my loving honey, bunny boo boo <laughs> yeah. on our anniversary <laughs> day, <laughs> you know? So, you know, you have to sort of take that reality as not really probably reality to begin with, but then also to be fair in your assessment, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. You know, I think you're my new therapist. I try, you know, <laughs> but that's honestly, that's part of why I'm doing my doula training and why I want to be a different kind of doula. So I really want to be a doula of the feminine arts. So I want it to include preconception, postpartum, sexuality, pleasure, like your relationship with yourself. So it's not just, I'm here supporting you during your pregnancy, but through all of the aspects of navigating your journey, like mothering yourself, mothering your baby, because there's so many things that people don't talk about in relation to women's health. There were so many things that I just didn't know. And I'm someone who was obsessed with birth and obsessed with pregnancy and all the things. And there were so many things that have been huge learning lessons for me. You know, I didn't expect to, I didn't know. Like I had moments where I was so hot during my early pregnancy or people don't say, hey, you really have to eat like every two hours, always have a snack or just like, it might be challenging for you to connect with your baby at the beginning. And that's okay. There were just things that I wish people talked about more. I, I was talking to someone the other night who was postpartum and was saying, you know, it was really hard for me. And you hear all these stories of women saying, oh, I've never felt a love like this in my life. And she said, I do love my child, but it took me a while and I was challenged. And so I think that I just want to create a space where there's a dialogue and an openness for people to be able to come and share their experiences without judgment and so that you can feel less alone and you I don't have to then have that judgment. I mean, DFA, Dual of Feminine Art, sounds like incredible and like you're the right person <laughs> to pioneer that. But don't leave us out. I think men need your wisdom and insight too, DMA. Do love men. Oh my words. gosh, I would love that. Yeah. And inviting men into the conversation, inviting partners into the conversation, inviting family, hey, this is how I need to be supported. Hey, this is what would feel good because pregnancy can be so isolating. And I think that we have to teach people how to take care of us. Starting with us. Exactly. Starting um, with yourself. <laughs> let's take a little break. I'm going to have to listen to this episode like three times to get everything I can <laughs> out of you. Let's take a little break. When we come back, we'll talk about your imminent birth and the plans you have for it. <laughs> Welcome. 
Welcome back. We're talking to a super pregnant rumor. Well, I have a couple more things I want to talk to you about. One is your plans for birth. You kind of leaked out their possible home birth with your sister there. Yeah. Ideally, that's where I would love to do it at home with my partner. I have a fantastic midwife and doula team who are just truly have such incredible community of women to help me through this process and feel confident in myself and in my power. But I'm also at the same time, especially because I have that tendency and working on control, I'm really not letting myself be fixated. If at any point someone said to me, you know what, there's a little bit high risk, like if I did an ultrasound or something like that, and someone brought forward anything that could be a potential risk, I don't feel like I need to prove something or that I have to, you know, tough it out. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is just having a, a healthy baby. Have you gotten advice from family or friends that is meaningful to you that you've so far mm. found helpful? I ask that because, you know, I say this all the time, but back in the day, you used to live with the family. We all did on family properties and villages. And we used to just see pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, mm -hmm. it was all natural. And sometimes we don't, we don't have that much exposure to it anymore. That's why we even do these before and after episodes to give exposure to all sorts of different birth experiences. Sometimes you get stuff from your family or friends that is helpful pearls of wisdom. I think one of the most amazing things that my doula, Lori Bregman, who's just an angel, if any of you out there are looking for a doula, she's also who's training me in my doula mentorship. I think something that she said to me, so my mom had all three of us unmedicated in a hospital, but unmedicated. And Lori said to me, you have an imprint for that because that's how your mom birthed you. You know, I came into the world, you know, not by C-section, like she had a vaginal delivery without an epidural. And she was like, and that's imprinted in you. And so for me, it was never a question that I wanted to do it that way. And I think there's something to be said for just trusting your body and trusting the process of birth that is such a ancestral thing. You know, if I was laying out flat cold, my body would still know exactly what to do at the end of the day. And look, that's not to say that whatever your birth experience is, I don't want to judge or, you know, Whatever someone feels the safest and right for you, I encourage that above all else. I think the most important thing for me to share is just is that you get curious. Make whatever decision you want. If you want to have a C-section in the hospital, if you want to be medicated on your back, whatever, if you want to be at home, if you want to be in a stream, if you want a dolphin-assisted birth, whatever you want, just ask all the questions and like be informed of all of your options so that you can come from a place of empowerment and know that whatever you decide, that you can do it. Oh my God, you just literally read the mission statement for informed pregnancy right off our website. <laughs> We're on the same page. Are there things though that you particularly, be, especially with the two roos that live in your head, you know, <laughs> super chill roo and super anxious roo, I can imagine they approach this upcoming experience from different vantage points. Are there things that you're very excited about and, and things that you're also kind of worried about? Weirdly, the birth part is the only part that doesn't scare me as much or that the more kind of, I would say, antagonistic or, or freaked out rule sometimes has. Like, I feel really confident in my ability to birth this baby. You know, my partner and I ended up kind of, I think at like month seven, ended up finding out the gender. And immediately there was this disconnect. It was like a thing got plugged in. And suddenly I was having conversations. I felt so much more connected. It wasn't like, oh, there's like a tiny little newt swimming in my belly too. There's a person and who has chosen me to be their mother, who has chosen all of my stuff, all of my flaws, who has chosen my partner, who has decided that they want to come in and be with me and do this life with me. And so it really became in my head, we're doing this together. We are co-creating this experience together. and to really trust the timing, how they want to be born. I think, again, this is a little woo-woo, but I think <laughs> kids come in and they're going to come what time they want, 
they're going to come how they want, whether that's in 24, 48 hours or five hours, you know, like it doesn't matter. You got to just, again, surrender and co-create the process with them i think or that's at least what i'm trying to kind of manifest for myself it sounds like this is one area where the two rooms might sort of be in harmony yeah very much so and also just leaving space for whatever comes you know i have a glorious backed up doctor who's dr crane who i think has delivered like everyone 80 million babies <laughs> everyone delivered both my half sisters tons of my friends i think my mom even went to go see him when she was pregnant with me so I have an incredible team that I really trust and I have an amazing partner and I've been at quite a few births. I was at both of my sister's births and then my younger oh, sister, wow. Mabel, and then at a few other friends' births. So I've seen quite a bit and I'm also that birth junkie who literally is like scrolling Instagram, watching the birth videos. <laughs> so, oh, so yeah, I feel so very prepared for that. Along those lines, what kind of things are you doing in the final months, weeks to get your mind and body ready for this big experience? Well, I'm definitely coming to see you because I have had crazy sciatica this oh, yes. whole time, which is not so fun. That but, is a pain um, in the butt. It really is. <laughs> I totally did the classic pregnant woman trope of, you know, six weeks before birth redoing my kitchen and doing construction <laughs> in my house which is just you know how nesting. could i not the nesting thing is very serious i did not realize it's like even on a day like today i have nothing to do today other than talk to you i could lay in bed all day and just treat myself make some hot tea and then i sit there and i try and relax and the only thing i can think about is putting diapers into a dresser that i don't yet have <laughs> or organizing or, or folding up clothes, whatever, you know, it's like I that that feeling, I, I got to get it ready. I got to get it ready. Which is so funny because all the baby needs is you. Exactly. Are you watching things or listening to things, reading things? Well, actually, honestly, listening to your podcast, for me, listening to stories and listening to other women's experiences are so helpful for me because I think especially when people share honestly and from a, just a depthful place, I think it really helps because you go, I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can do that. And I've loved it. And I love the before and after because there's such a beauty, I think, in the expectation and then really talking about how it was. I was reading this incredible book called Safe Infant Sleep, which I really enjoyed because I realized that you know, ideally, my goals are to only breastfeed and to breast sleep or co-sleep. But I didn't see a lot of information about it. And I know that there are obviously risks involved. But again, I wanted to be informed. I want to know everything. I want to be able to make a decision from a place where it's not just based on fear, because I don't like operating out of a place of fear. I don't. I think that it's unhelpful. I think that We've seen a lot of it in the last couple of years of just projection and judgment and resistance. And I think that each mother should be able to make a choice about what's right for them, what's right for their family. And it's helped me a lot in certain ways. Like I didn't used to think that I would be a mom who cared about what kind of pillows I have or the mattress I have or the chemicals in them or you know, how to sleep with your baby or what kind of food or what kind of cleaning supplies I have in the house. But I do, you know, because I've asked questions and I've been curious. I didn't have to get the Rogam shot because I asked questions, you know, and I found an NLPT that could test my baby's blood and I found out we have the same type. So normally they just give you that shot at 28 weeks, which is fine if you need it. And if I have to get it the next time I'm pregnant, then I will. But I didn't have to this time. Oh, so you and your partner are each incompatible? You're negative and he's positive? Yeah. Okay, we'll do an episode on that at some point and explain what that's all about. But that's the yeah, whole thing. If you don't have the information, you can't be a participant in decision making. What about film? Any of the documentaries? Oh, yes. I mean, the business of being born was a huge one. And I just actually got to go to an incredible luncheon with Abby and Ricky, who are celebrating the 15 year anniversary and doing a re release. With years. It's so crazy. Years. People assume. 
still that that happened like two years ago when they watched the film and she I must know. have a two year old. <laughs> Well, and I showed it to a friend of mine who's pregnant who's about three weeks ahead of me and she was going to do a hospital birth. And then after watching it, it was like, I want to do it at home. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Now, having been in this field for 20 years with the business of being born out for 15, most people watch it at the very least. They're like, wait a second, I need to do more homework and know mm -hmm. my options. Some of them are like, oh, I don't want that experience. I want to give birth at home. And some of them actually watch it and like, okay, I definitely want to give birth at the hospital, but I need to know more. So it's a very powerful, iconic film. Right now it's streaming on Informed Pregnancy Plus along with a bunch of other films. I cannot tell you of our 350 episodes, I cannot tell you how many people bring up that film as like, that is where... I realized I need to have information and they got started on their empowerment journey. It's so important. And I think just having the information, right? Having the confidence to ask questions. I have, you know, a bunch of friends who struggled with breastfeeding, but then don't necessarily have the resources or support or maybe understand the importance of it. And, you know, like in that book I was reading about safe infant sleep, obviously we all know how important it is to breastfeed. And if you can, that's great. But it's just a tip of the iceberg, the information that's public compared to all of the things that I've at least dived into. And, you know, there's a couple of different documentaries on breastfeeding that I watched. I watch everything because I'm just kind of a junkie for this stuff. But I think there's one called The Milky Way. And there's, there's just so much. There's, a, there's an amazing breast milk, documentary. The documentary. There's yeah. The Milky Way. And there's others on breastfeeding also. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Each one of them is so powerful. You know, that's why we actually made Informed Pregnancy Plus, because they're like out there somewhere, but it's hard to find them all. And then if you do find them, you, you know, usually you've got to run each one and it can really add up. So my vision for our two films and all the other birth content I can find was to just put them in one place, easy to access, and everybody can do a free trial and watch as much as you want during the trial period. Then it's six dollars for all you can eat, really. But to your point about like not everybody has the resource so we're building workshops workshops about lactation with tons mm -hmm. of valuable information that is just part of the package and uh, postpartum my wife's postpartum workshop is already up there the afterbirth plan and so much other content like that you're a birth junkie <laughs> you feel to me like you've been <laughs> a mom already you know and now you're coming around for round two in this world i feel that way a lot of the time it's hard to find all the information. I want to talk to you about one more thing before we sign off. Rumor has it. This is your business. Tell me about Rumor has it. First of all, I can't get the song out of my mind after watching that dance with the stars, but <laughs> tell me about Rumor has it. So ideally, it's, you know, it's in a certain way, kind of a bit like what you're trying to create as well. I want to create a space obviously for non-pregnant women as well. You know, I kind of was using the model of goop, right? But really, because I'm obviously a new mother and, you know, there's so many different things. What stroller do you get? What kind of bottle do you use? If you're having issues breastfeeding, what do you do? I really want to create kind of this foundational space, I would say, for the doula of the feminine archetype to really flourish because I want to have that be the platform for, hey, these are the things that no one's going to tell you about that you need in the first trimester. These are the life hacks or the things that will save you. And these are the things that you don't need to spend crazy money on or, you know, just a place where women can go to have a forum and a community to talk about all this kind of stuff and get information about all the different things. I mean, pleasure, relationship, motherhood, bottles, you know, what's the best kind of non-toxic pillow or things or cribs or what's safe, all of it. Sounds incredible. You know, you find in this birth world, you find puzzle pieces that are all trying to put that village back together, fill mm -hmm. in the, the blanks. And, you know, it started with professions, but since we're not on the property and we don't know, so you have a lactation consultant, you have a childbirth educator, you have a baby nurse, a doula, but there's all these resources that we could put together and make an online village, an online puzzle. And it sounds like Rumor Has It is going to be an incredible, unique puzzle piece that's going to help a lot of people. Thank you for doing that. I'm excited because I love sharing. You know, it's, I have this thing that I 
got that I found from my osteopath's office that is a hot towel warmer. And I bought these from this lovely little mother in Tennessee. She makes like hand sewn little microwavable hot pack. And so I'm using that for my home birth. So you literally just put the little microwavable hot packs in this hot towel warmer. And so I have heat pads then accessible Mm -hmm. all the time. And it's been so helpful during my pregnancy. Whenever I've had back pain or I can't see you or whatever it is, you know, it's great. And there are little things that make a huge difference, but you might not know them. But we will know. Yes, you will. Rumor, I am sending the most beautiful vibes for an incredible birth. And I cannot wait for you to come back and share the story with us, the rest of the story. In the meantime, where can we find you online? Um, On my Instagram, which is just my name, Rumor Willis. And hopefully we'll be sharing more things as I get closer to this birth. And that will be where I do kind of all of the rumor has it building and announcements as well. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm not going to lie, I'm a tiny bit jealous of your baby. (laughs) 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 All right. If you want to find us online, you can find the podcast, you can find the blog, you can find Informed Pregnancy Plus, all at informedpregnancy.com. I got a whole